Welcome to GPS again today. And I've been waiting a week for this day because we have uh, accumulated some questions that uh, we're going to answer today. We're going to get answered today. So I'm waiting. Don't promise too I was much. I say the pressure's on. This is all of you. I Dr. Have John to Pauline, <laughs> the one, uh, the dean of the School of Religion, the 28 years at Andrews, and all the rest. But anyway, we're having fun. Uh, but these are questions that we've wrestled with. I have certainly wrestled with it. Uh, I have wrestled since college, uh, which is when I first began to be exposed to uh, certain interpretations of Revelation, and uh, struggled with them as did many of my generation and certainly people in my classes over the years. And so, uh, you know, let's see where we can go with that today. So two of the questions are, when are these seven seals of Revelation 6? I'm hoping you're getting a Bible out and, and catching up with us here. We're ready to talk about it. We've talked about the Old Testament background. We've gone to Leviticus 27. We went to Deuteronomy 32. We went to Zechariah 1. We went to Zechariah 6. We went to... Ezekiel 14, 14. Mm -hmm. and then a wonderful passage in Matthew 24, another mm -hmm. set of parallels. Yeah. We have the same physical signs and uh, the heavens and, and a lot of parallels, fantastic. So uh, we wrestled a little bit, you know, are the seven seals primarily eras of history, looking at the whole Christian era, or are they primarily still future or some hybrid of both? The other question I'm waiting for an answer for is uh, the identity of the first, uh, the first horseman and the, ho the horse. So we're hopeful in 25, 26 minutes that we'll get some answers today. We'll see. Anyway, where do we want to go uh, with this now, Revelation mm -hmm. 6 and 7? Well, you, you laid out a thesis last time that could it be that chapter 7 and chapter 6 are two ways of describing the same event? So that they're both, you know, if, if chapter 7 is really down at the end of time, still our future, maybe all of chapter 6 is as well. And I wanted to point out something that a lot of people have missed in chapter 6. And let's start with chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. It says, I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, as with a voice of thunder... Come, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out, conquering and to conquer. All right? So you have four living, uh, one of the four living creatures calls to this horse and lets him go. All right? Verse 3, when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and another a red horse went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and so on. So the first horse goes out. The second horse goes out. Whatever those two horses are doing happens right away. Okay? Verse 5. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Do you notice him going out? Mm -mm. Nope. Nothing there. Fourth uh, horse, verse 7. When he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had named Death, and Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and the wild beasts of the earth. So that is a devastating, devastating plague for a fourth of the earth. But he doesn't go out. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that. You know, I, I would never have noticed this in the English, but it was just in working through the Greek, this exelthen, he went mm -hmm. out. It's a, it's a very obvious word that jumps out. That suggests to me that the four horsemen of chapter 6 and the four winds of chapter 7, they are parallels, but they don't happen at exactly the same time. 
that these horses are like preliminary judgments and they aren't carried out to the full. But when you get to chapter seven, which is part of the sixth seal, so you have one, two, three, four horses and then a fifth seal and now a sixth seal and then you have the four angels holding the four winds so that they would not go over the earth. So there is a final sending out of these four horses that is a total destruction at the end of time, but that happens in the, in the sixth seal, not, not in the first, second, and third. Just for discussion. Yes, sir. Is it possible that that is not sequential or chronological, but in chapter seven, it is simply a pulling back of the curtain to explain how we got to chapter six. This is how these things happen. Mm -hmm. You don't understand what's Let me show you. And it is, uh, what's happening here is that God is letting go. And now we understand how these things are happening is that when before then, God was holding back, but now he's letting go. So it is an explanation of the first four seals rather than a new and separate event, just for discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just interesting, two horses go out and two don't. So that's, that seems to be a with different a situation than chapter seven. Because it where says they're, they're writing. All four are being, well. They're still writing and one says The third seal is no writing. What's that? Third seal is no writing at all. It says he the writer, a, he's the writer. He's a writer, he's but that's, that's an English word. And the, the fourth Greek one, there's the a one writer who was writer, the fourth one, yeah. he's following. Well, the one sitting on the horse, you know, we would, writer is a translation. Well, I was yeah. going to also say it's kind of like giving a task to a group of people. Like in pastor's meeting, you may say, like, here, Tony, you go do this. That needs to be done immediately. Sarah, yours is due next month. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's mm -hmm. not, I don't need to do anything at that moment. It's just I kind of know, like, here's my duty, here's my task. Well, let me show you one more thing that's sometimes overlooked. Verse 2, chapter 6. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now that's an odd expression in the English, and it's also odd in the Greek, it's very rare. But he went out conquering and in order that he might conquer. And that is the most continuous expression possible in the Greek language. Yeah, here it says, rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Yeah, so it means that when this white horse goes out, he never stops going out. He's going out constantly throughout whatever period of time we're talking about here. So uh, there's something about the white horse that's really special, it's continuous. Whereas the others, it doesn't use that language. I'm not trying to argue because I don't know where you're going with this. So, yeah. so I, 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 don't, I don't know the final punchline. Could it be that you know the picture, the paintings are the four mm -hmm. horsemen coming mm -hmm. together? Here they come. Yeah. Is that they come out and they says, they come out, the first one comes out, second one. By the time you get to the third and fourth one, they're all out, mm -hmm. rather than some... They're in view. Yeah. But the first and the second are, are, are explicitly said to go out, and the others aren't. So where are you going to go with that? How does that link? Well, as I, as I was saying, the fact that two of them, the two that are the least damaging go out. The ones that are really damaging don't. And that suggests a mitigation of judgment. It's as a warning judgment. Whereas in chapter seven, when they let go, bam, it's all over. You see. So I would see chapter six uh, as before chapter seven. That chapter seven is part of the sixth seal, and therefore it wouldn't make sense for it to be part of the first seal as well. Mm. It's uh, mm. the sixth seal sets the stage. He asks the question. You know, when the great day of his wrath comes, who will be able to stand? And then you look and you see the 144,000 and the great multitude. So that's clearly end time. I think everybody would, would recognize that. Whatever's going on, these four horsemen is before then, is what I think uh, is the picture. So the question is, what is it about? And, and the question I have for you oh, good. is... Uh, <laughs> and, it's only uh, fair. You know, the question, well, when does the lamb take the book? I would, I and Dan can answer that too, because I think he has an opinion. I'm, I'm forming one. I'm going to think about it. Yeah. This is in chapter five. Well, You're talking about back to chapter five. Remember that chapter six and chapter five are closely linked. Mm -hmm. Chapter five, the Lamb takes the book, 
Everybody celebrates that he took the book and he can open it now. Chapter mm -hmm. six, he starts opening the book. When he opened the first seal, here's the horse. Okay, so. Well, when was he handed the book? Yeah, the, the scroll. That, that's the crucial question. I, I don't know. I mean, it says then I saw Liam looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center, and then that's when he gets it. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. Is that what you're referring so to? So it's after the cross. After the crucifixion. When? That when year? That uh, 100 years if later? 1,000 years? God's outside of time. Let's be real. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, how are we supposed to know that? Just to be the A student in the class, he said that it was at the day of Pentecost. I don't remember that. I probably tuned that out. <laughs> 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 to be the F student in the class. Well, wasn't that, didn't that make the case when the God of Christ was inaugurated in, the, in heaven? He is now seated at the right hand of God, and he now has the book. So you're, you're just being millennial here, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> but, but, but going back to Dan, all right? If you want to see the primary purpose of chapter 6 as future... How does that connect with the scene of chapter 5? I'll tell you what I think. And yeah, you, that, can, that's, you can fix it. <laughs> I, I believe that, that at the end of the world, there will be the latter rain. Mm -hmm. We have struggled slowly, slowly for 2,000 years to get the message to go around the world. But that finally, here at the end, the mystery will be fully revealed, and Christ is going to... Be with power, the gospel is going to go. The upper room people, 144,000, we'll talk about in the next few weeks, will go out and give the message, and that, that truth about what I believe is in the scroll will finally be the most clear. There's been glimmers of it all along, but then it'll be the, the light in Revelation 18 that'll go all and circle the whole earth will be at the end. Mm -hmm. So you would, you would see the seven spirits going out in chapter 5 as not Pentecost, A.D. 31, but end-time Pentecost. Beginning, beginning, small, slowly, little mission stations, little, and then all of a sudden, God turns the switch on, and it goes mm -hmm. crazy all over the world. And I guess the question I would have to ask, would that make any sense to John? That's a struggle. You when know, John I, sees the lamb that was slain and the, and the spirit going out as a result of that. I'm sure he'd be very disappointed to know that we're going to have this long delay. Just to quote a famous quote in the SDA commentary in Revelation 1, uh, Don Neufeld mm -hmm. wrote that John and everybody expected all this to be in the first century. That when Jesus says, I'm coming back, and Paul says, the night is far gone, please don't even get married, and be like me, because we don't have time to spend time with all that. He's coming. And gradually, time has spun out, and here we are 2,000 years later, still waiting for I am coming soon to be fulfilled. So I'm sure John would be very disappointed. Well, have. he is disappointed in chapter 10, where he's told, you know, you must prophesy again. Yes. But that's in the sixth trumpet when he's told that. And the point is what? Well, the, the point is that uh, John, he's not told that here, but he is told that in chapter 10, that even after a number of events happen, there's still more that has to happen. Yes, yes, you know? yes. But, uh, hmm. all right, let all me, right. Let me gonna, show you why, you I, this? why I have a slightly different view of that. <laughs> Just from 2,000 years, years of Sarah. 2,000 years different. No, I was just going to say, I think this is where it gets hard um, for someone like me that tends to live more in the moment mm -hmm. um, because it's that same thing. Is is that, like you said, maybe John was disappointed because it was so long between. But I think that's also the problem is, is that we sometimes focus so much on the future, we forget about taking care of the present and being good people now. And like... Why don't you make that speech about the past? At least we're in, uh, you're on my side. This is the moment that's about to come. We're going to be in this moment. I, <laughs> the history is a moment 2,000 years ago. Well, I'm just saying, I think it's the same thing. And I think we're so easy to say, like, um, 
like I remember when I was a kid and my mom would tell me I couldn't snack because dinner was coming. It felt like an eternity and I was just starving in my head, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> it was 20 minutes, but like it seemed like forever. And I feel like sometimes we focus so much on future stuff that we create an eternity in our own minds and we lose focus and get disgruntled and angry and miss out on opportunity. So I don't know, I just think it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a frustrating. It's so shocking because I just knowing you, you would be <laughs> right with me on this. I'm always with you. Pastor. We're right on the edge of this. <laughs> We're experiencing it. We're beginning to see the experiencing of it. We're ready to experience this fullness of all this. No, let's go back to 1800 years ago <laughs> and no Roman Nero and uh, you know a very Middle Eastern interpretation of it. Uh, but you got 26 books of the New Testament that are back in the first century. What yeah. do you do with those? Hmm. Why not read them totally in the future? Hmm. And I think the reason you wouldn't do that is they're so obviously in the first century. The reason people can play with the book of Revelation is because it's so hard to understand. And where it's hard to understand, people can come along and say, well, it doesn't mean that, it means this. Yeah. You see, now, the, the ultimate question that matters is not what you think, not what I think, not what Sarah thinks. Probably Although what Sarah good. thinks is probably more important than what we think. <laughs> oh, no, no. But, uh, you know, because women have often not been paid attention to with great cost oh. through the ages. Well, I am so. not the example that you should be setting on this one. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but you're the example we have here. Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, I think the crucial thing is what would John understand and why is that important? It's because God didn't give revelation in 1995. If this book was supposed to be all about our day in the next 20 years, I think it would have been smart to give it, you know, within our lifetime. But he gave it in 95 AD. That means it had to make sense back then. Mm -hmm. And so the question with Revelation 5 is not what does it mean to me or what does it mean to Dan or what does it mean to Sarah? The question ultimately is what would have had to have meant to John if we can get that. Now maybe mm -hmm. if it's still unclear then we can go any way we want. But if John tells us what it means to him, it's very, I think, dangerous to go in another place and, and say something else. So. But, but Dan's looking at me and saying, prove De it, defend that. Prove De it, boy. Let me make you defend that. <laughs> yeah. How do you know that it, it has to be that way? How can it not, why can't it be that John gets a vision which is going to be fairly mm -hmm. opaque to him? Maybe he gets a glimmer from it, but he, it's, it's vouchsafed away later. It will come clear later. Why does, good. Why, does the, why does it have to be clear to him from the very beginning? There's one place in the Bible where you can make that case, and that's the book of Daniel. Remember, in the, in the last part of the book of Daniel, in chapter 12, uh, God says to Daniel, shut up the book, seal it, close it, because it's for the time of the end. <laughs> All right? That's, uh, if somebody comes to me and say, Daniel, special meaning at the end of time, yeah, it's pretty obvious. But notice, Revelation is different. Chapter 1, verse 3, blessed is he who reads... Present tense. present tense, and those who hear, present tense, the words of the prophecy and heed the things written in it for the time is near. So the book of Revelation is not obscure, is not designed for another time and place, it's designed to be understood at the time it was given. So if prophecy follows the principle of God meeting people where they are, and I think all of this stuff in the Old Testament helps demonstrate that, doesn't it? John, his mind was going crazy as he writes chapter 6 because there's Leviticus and there's Deuteronomy and there's Zechariah and there's Ezekiel. And all this stuff is popping into his head and the words are popping up there. So I think the problem is we have a hard time understanding the book because we're not there. But John had an easier time of it. Are you saying that John wouldn't have needed to understand all seven seals and all seven trumpets or just get the first one because this is his time? And then the second one and all the rest of them would be later. Well, I think uh, that as God is working with John, the things that were in John's time would need to be clear. And the things that are future would need to be clear. And I think the problem with, with people coming to the book and saying it's all future or it's all first century 
Uh, they're both determining what the book is saying and not letting John tell them. And I, you know, my argument is let John tell it his way. All right. And make sense of it. From John himself. From John. I, I caught John that John will tell you what John meant. <laughs> That's I'm right. saying, yeah. I feel like this is a little biased. <laughs> All right. Let's, let, let's go see if that's correct. All right. Revelation 3.21. And this to me is the, is the core insight because we'll discover as we go through the book of Revelation that John often buries the explanation of something yet to come in the conclusion of the proceeding. You got the word? Mm-hmm. I'm going to get that A again. Oh, I wasn't paying attention. Duo to directionality. Yeah. You remember? Duo directionality. Yep, that's right. Yeah. You see, I got from a certain Pauline book. And in the climax of Revelation <laughs> 3, here. verse 21, <laughs> notice what it says. He who overcomes, present tense, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, future tense, as I also overcame, past tense, and sat down with my father on his throne, past tense. So you got three things here. You have past, you got present, and you got future. Mm -hmm. Now, this chapter 3, verse 21, is a nutshell summary of the seven seals. Okay. Where's the throne of the father? Chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Where's Jesus joined the father on the throne? Chapter right hand of the Father. Chapter five. Chapter five. Where do God's people join Jesus on the throne? Later. Chapter seven. <laughs> yeah, you know, later. At the end of chapter seven, you see them standing mm -hmm. before the throne. So there's present tense. What's the one thing that's not covered in this verse yet? Chapter six. The seals in between. It's all about the overcoming. And the parallel with Matthew 24 helps with that. It's all about the overcoming that God's people have to go through, modeled on Jesus' overcoming. So the cross is the center. Jesus is the center. But in chapter 6, it's how people respond to the cross. Are there any linguistic connections to Matthew 24 for the over overcoming? Um, not the overcoming. The overcoming is a, is a word that's primarily in Revelation. Is the idea in there? Well, you're going to have to endure this. This gospel of the kingdom will go into the whole world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. So the first task in Matthew is the gospel going forth. But now, if the white horse is the gospel, then that all fits. But it talks about being yeah. ready and waiting and being mm -hmm. uh, awake. So yeah. there's some parallels. Mm -hmm. So just for the audience to remember, so the dual, direction, dual directionality is that at the end of one mm -hmm. part of the scripture, there is a cue that ties up that theme and points forward to the next theme. So it's pointing yeah. both ways, time, past, and future, and might help us unlock the interpretation. This overcoming text is one of seven in the seven churches, chapters two and three. So it's the climax. In fact, each of the churches gets an added promise until the sixth church gets six promises, and then the seventh gets the killer. Sit with me on my throne. If you got that, you got them all, right? <laughs> Or, or, or just for understanding, are you unique to this, or is this a pretty common understanding among Revelation scholars? Is the dual directionality? That these verse links past and future to guess and helps explain it. I was the first person to put it in that way, and uh, unfortunately I've been busy with a lot of things and haven't published it. I've, I've given it at conferences. Uh, there's a scholar, Elizabeth Fiorenza, that uses the term intercalation of texts. It, it, it sounds impressive, and uh, I don't and it think should. I can even say that. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's how texts kind of, you know, do this kind of oh, thing. Oh, collating. Intercalation. Collating. It's it's like one after I get another. It. <laughs> it's like going back and forth, sort of a you know, mm -hmm. bouncing like this. So I, I think she's getting the same idea and, and bringing it out, but uh, not quite in the same way that but I. But it have. serves as an outline and it can help us interpret interpret. Yeah. It. And you'll find, as we go through the book, you'll find several of these texts along the way. And, and uh, it's pretty dramatic when you see them. So the reference to the throne, it's in mm -hmm. 321, ties mm -hmm. to chapter 4. Yeah. The reference to Christ now sitting with the Father goes mm -hmm. to chapter 5. Mm -hmm. And chapter 7 is when we can join with me to sit at the right hand of God, would yeah. be Revelation 7, great multitude and all of that. Well, you, you have in verse 15, they're before the throne of God day and night in his temple. Yeah. Hmm. And then what's missing 
is chapter 6. So the, and the one piece of 321 that's missing is the one who overcomes. I will grant to sit with me on my throne. So chapter 6, I believe, is all about the process of overcoming. Overcoming. Interesting. You know, and uh, whether you see it in a historicist fashion as the seals are one after another through history, or whether you see it as more of a general description of what life is like, uh, that I think is open to discussion, and we'll get more into that as we get into the chapter. Okay, okay. So that's one example. If chapter five <coughs> is the inauguration rather than the Day of Atonement, that would point toward the beginning of the Christian era. Uh, if it's the daily service rather than the Day of Atonement, that would, you know, intercession is going on throughout the Christian era. Because we talked about that yeah. the other day. You said mm -hmm. the first half of the book is more the daily, yeah. the second half of the book is a little more mm -hmm. Day of Atonement. And if Pentecost is the foundation, then that's when the first horse starts going out is the time of Pentecost. And in the end, the scroll, the opening of the scroll is the eschatological event, and that doesn't happen until the seventh seal is opened. So whatever we do with the scroll doesn't really kick in. So these seals seem to me to be a bit more preliminary than just end time. Interesting. So what, what, is, what, what difference does it make, Sarah? Uh, you, I, this is not your style of of Bible study. So what would you make of all no, this? No, I just, I think that's, that makes a little bit more sense to me because otherwise he would have done like a rapid fire seal opening, <laughs> like, brrr, and then mm -hmm. everything opened simultaneously, that's where like here it's more of a process. And so there's mm -hmm. more things happening. And I think, I think in the way it's been presented to me in the past has been where um, this is all future. And so none of it really pertains to now. So like, you can you can take pieces of it and try to come up with things with it, but the beauty of it is is like opening things in a progression shows how God works. I think a little bit differently than how sometimes He's been presented, and so that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm I'm close to that, but not the same as that. Because mm -hmm. I would surely see us as very heavily involved in the gospel going clearly to the world and mm -hmm. evil being let loose. I mean, there's evil going all over the world today, so I, I see all this happening already. Right. Yes. Let me give you one more, one more piece in the last minute we have left. Uh, Revelation 6 and verse 9. When he broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained, cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those so fifth seal, well down the line, God has not judged. Chapter 19, verse 2, it says, uh, verse 1, After these things I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, power belong to our God. Clearly end time. Because his judgments are true and righteous, he's judged the great harlot who's corrupting the earth with her immorality and has avenged the blood uh, of her servants on her hand. So clearly, fifth seal is before chapter 19. It's before the end time events. And there's, there's a number of those kind of clues that, that for me uh, kind of help to see where I think John is heading. How do you feel? <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful to get it right finally. No. I thank you for the discussion, and we got to go. Uh, as always, uh, it's been great, John, and thank you for the expertise that you bring to it. It's a great passage, and I can hardly wait to take it to the next time. So be with us next time. God bless you.